Hang on, bro. Oh, boo. Hang on. We can hear you, so please put yourself on mute. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's seven o'clock, so I think we should probably um, get started. Um, so apologies um, for absence. Um, we have got... Uh, Who have we got? Sorry. Uh, Tarek Mahmood, um, and we've got substitution of um, Yol, uh, Councillor Yol Gordon um, for uh, Councillor Polly Newstub, and we've also got um, Councillor Andrew Steed um, on behalf of Councillor John Ball. Um, there are no um, urgent matters arising, um, and just part of the course, um, has um, anyone got any declarations of interest? Um, I haven't received any matters to be considered in private, so we can then go forward to um, the minutes from our last meeting, which was the 27th of September. Yes, only three weeks ago. Um, has everyone had a chance to read the minutes? Um, and are we all agreed that they were accurate? Okay, agreed. Okay, um, so tonight's meeting is to um, run through an update um, of where we're at with the local development plan. Um, we've got three, no, four speakers. Um, so we'll um, get going with um, Ezra El, I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly now, aren't I? I should have checked this. El Rahman, is that right? Um, uh, Senior Good Growth um, Engagement Officer. If you want to go ahead. Thanks. Sam, are you okay to get the presentation up? Apologies, I've not got it yet. Uh, bear with me, I should just be a minute. Do you have that now? Yes, great, thank you so much. Um, so um, just a quick introduction um, on the work that I'm doing at the moment um, for the strategic planning team. So I'm working on the Reg 18 and, and 19 consultation 
uh, programs, um, prepping the engagement events and overall program um, for both consultations. Um, I've put together an engagement strategy to complement the statement for community involvement that's now on the Ealing website, um, available to view. Um, and at present, before we launch on November 30th, I'm doing some pre-outreach um, to um, interested stakeholders and the general public. Sam, can you go to the second slide, please? Thanks. So where are we in the, in the new local plan um, consultation um, structure? So in terms of milestones, um, we are at the pre-launch stage. We're currently 6.5 weeks away from our launch. Um, the draft new local plan is currently being completed and then it, it still needs to go through its design phase. Um, and then hoping um, for the consultation um, to uh, launch on the 30th of November until the until January 25th. Um, next slide, please, Sam. Um, so in terms of who we are reaching from the community, um, we want to um, be meaningful um, with a push to get those who, who don't usually respond um, to a local plan to engage with us. Um, so the, the Regulation 18 consultation is structured in two phases to analyze that reach. Um, the first phase will take us up to Christmas, um, and then during this period, we'll analyze who we've engaged with, and then if needed to uh, develop the second phase um, in order to reach more people. Um, it is a statutory consultation, so we will be consulting with the um, relevant statutory bodies. Um, again, the local plan consultation strategy is on the website. Um, and we will have varied types of engagement events, which I will get to in a minute. Um, we have Commission Built ID to host two surveys for us, um, a shorter survey um, aimed at engaging with um, younger people and those who don't usually engage in this process, and the longer survey embedded in the local plan document, um, taking people directly to questions after each policy. Um, we will aim to, well, we will re-engage with those who took part in shaping Ealing um, to make sure that they know it's a fluid process um, and to um, show them how their feedback has helped influence making the local plan. And we will also be collaborating with other teams in the council who were consulting at the same time to limit consultation fatigue. Um, and also to make sure that people know how all these consultations are interlinked. Um, next day, uh, a slide, please, Sam. Yes. So moving on to the consultation schedule, um, just briefly. Um, so this will be split into three approaches to maximize reach. And also because compared to the last time that we went out to consult um, on the local plan, um, we didn't have a lot of resources, but now there's so much we can do, um, especially utilizing how uh, uh, social media and how we use um, digital approaches. Um, so just to briefly outline, um, again, we will have the two surveys. We'll also have online Q&A sessions, um, one specifically for developers and um, others for the general public. Um, we will be utilizing social media from both um, our comms team and also Built ID, who will be doing a targeted approach to communities um, using translations and other means. Um, we'll also be issuing a newsletter every two weeks, um, and then we'll also try to use the, the Ealing Council website um, as, this, as best as we can to reach people. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. Um, so then this takes us on to the printed um, approach. Um, obviously, we also need to make sure that whatever we're doing online, we're replicating offline. So it's a statutory requirement for us to have the, the draft new local plan document um, printed um, and uh, distributed to all 13 libraries in the borough. Uh, we'll also make sure that there are feedback forms and other ways to um, provide feedback attached with the document. Um, we'll also be sending letters and notices to the specific statutory bodies, um, and we'll be using posters, banners, other forms of printed uh, materials to do engaging and 
um, engagement and outreach to different people. Um, next slide, please, Sam. Um, and of course, um, anything we do, we will make sure that we have um, a robust in-person um, plan as well. So we want to make sure that we have a presence in all seven towns, um, not only going out to engage on the local plan document, but also re-engaging with those who took part in shaping Ealing. Um, so we're going to host seven town workshops um, across the borough. Um, and to complement those workshops, we're going to be um, holding some library drop-in sessions. We're going to be doing some walking tours. Um, we're going to have a presence um, on the high streets. Um, and of course, like I said, we're going to be collaborating with other consultation events during this period. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm sorry for the uh, dramatic, dramatic uh, sound. Um, I just wanted to throw it open um, to um, some questions on that. So, um, Councillor Wall. Um, hello. <laughs> well done. A um, couple of questions, really, um, or three questions, really. Um, how are you going to get to the hard to respond groups? Because it's, it's an aspiration that I see, but I don't see the pathway to getting there you know the young um and on on kind of on the back of that what do you call young is it from 16 is it from 21 is it from 25 i don't everyone's young to me but um so uh and and what what do you do if they don't come you know what what's what's your what's in other words what would be a measure of a successful uh consultation and what would be uh you know what would not be a successful consultation Thanks, Councillor, um, and good questions. Um, so in terms of the first question, how to get to the heart to, to reach communities. Um, so a lot of this is in the local plan strategy um, that I've put on the website now. Um, but basically, we really want to kind of utilize the tools that um, Built ID um, have in terms of targeting communities through um, social media, other marketing, um, approaches um, they have a translation service so they will be doing ads th through through those translations um, and they have the ability to actually so if they know that there is a specific community in in an area in a town they have the ability to do a lot of marketing um, in that specific area so it's it's a very smart kind of system that they use um, as well as going to those communities as well through religious institutions, schools, um, outreaching to kind of the umbrella organizations that we have in the borough, um, producing um, packages, um, explaining what a local plan is, um, how shaping Ealing has kind of helped inform um, the local plan, and then also what their feedback is going towards and how that's kind of shaping regulation 18. We're hoping through the town workshops as well. Um, they're going to be very specific to that town. So each town will have a day workshop where we will focus on what we're doing in, in each town, so South or Ealing, et cetera. Um, looking at the policies we've written for those towns and the overall spatial strategy. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I could go on, it's a suite of kind of activities aimed um, at, at reaching those hard to reach communities in terms of how young um, in the strategy I have started from very young. Um, so if we're going to schools, we, we also wanna kind of target parents um, and get them to kind of explain to their kids, you know, what this process is. Um, and then starting from the age of 16, we wanna utilize social media, but also get them involved in, um, mapping exercises so look at kind of their communities how they use it um, and try to kind of weave that into into the discussions on um, policy and how that can kind of help shape their communities i'm also looking at implementing local community champions using local youth specifically for planning and area regeneration but at this point i think that's probably gonna be kind of 
midway into Reg 18, kind of supporting the next phase of the local plan, but there's nothing stopping that process in helping um, future consultations around the local plan. Um, and then in terms of what success looks like, someone did ask me that question before, and I just, I don't, it's not a figure that I can give you. I don't think reaching, you know, 10,000 or 15,000 people is a measure of success. I think it's about how meaningfully we're engaging with people, um, if their feedback has actually helped shape these policies. Um, and in terms of going back to those people in the future and saying, you came to us, you've said this, and this is what we've done with your comments, that that is success to me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't know if I can really answer this question in a figurative sense. Okay, does that answer? Yes, first, first part, yes, thank you. But success, I'm just a little bit worried that we don't know what what are we what where we're going you know the sense of you know you know you must have some sort of successful criteria uh, and and otherwise you know we can present 300 people yes they're really wonderful but they're the same 300 people that respond to everything you know um what i'm trying to say is you, you know proportion of young people a proportion of people as english as second language or something like that and uh, and and it would be a tangible thing to you know to say yeah we've 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 really gone out and listened to people and that's the, you know numbers do ma matter you know you can't just say numbers don't matter because um, they do and you know uh, and the more you get the more uh, variations of responses you'll get so I, I do think that we should have some sort of success criteria for consultations in my view. Yeah, I'll take that on board. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. All right, we've got a question from online from um, Councillor Gareth Shaw. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, some some of it's actually been covered in your answer there, so thanks very much for that. Um, but I was really just a, a request as well that if if you you know make sure that you do engage with with all council members. Um, I didn't see that sort of in in the slides specifically or in the papers specifically, but you know, of course, we we can be very helpful. Um, you know, we we can push it out to to our networks and memberships of of various organisations um, that we're involved with, and and just let let them know. Uh, so, if you could do that, please, then I think that would be helpful. Um, I also note on just on the eight weeks sort of looking at the calendar there quickly you know if if we were live now that runs us up to the beginning of December it mentions in in autumn um running through autumn and engaging with with other consultations that are taking place so you know bearing in mind it's not live now when a lot of the detail there was in planning um you know where realistically do you think that you might finish and not be lost in the Christmas sort of rush in December? Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor. Um, just on your first question, um, we are going to engage um, with councillors. We also have, um, well, we're planning a session with the community and engagement team um, in early November, um, all about kind of what the local plan is, what to expect, and then also how to engage, because we're kind of hoping that councillors will be with us um, during some of these engagement sessions and activities. Um, in terms of the second question, um, so the two phase, so as I said, it's split into two phases. I'm hoping the first phase will uh, wrap up by the 20th of um, December and then use kind of that Christmas period to do, to kind of push the surveys online to do all the digital stuff that we need to do. Um, and then also analyze um, who we've reached um, in order to develop the next phase of the consultation, which will start in the 2nd of January when most people will be back at work. Then we can get back out there on the streets, engaging with people. So sorry, just... Just to be clear then, in, in that period where you say that the, the push is online from the 20th of December, 
Mm. How do, do you mean that that is when the analysis of responses will be made? No, and, no. So and things come up, or, or that that's when you'll be pushing people sort of online to respond more online to that, because that obviously does clash with the Christmas period. You know, lot, lots of people might go away. They might not necessarily be online. Of course, more people might be at home and they, they might choose to respond to the consultation online. At the same time, it does strike me that it could lead us open to criticism that, you know, by running it over the Christmas period, we're, we're trying to sort of lose a week or two here um, as well, because inevitably that's what some residents will will criticise us with. So how would you respond to that? Um, well, just to say we're going to be pushing the digital um, activities from the beginning, so from the 30th of November. But we also understand that people won't be here during the Christmas and we don't expect people to engage with us on the streets um, during that period. Um, so we will be pushing the surveys from the 20th up until the 2nd of January. Um, it is six weeks statutory and we are going out to consult for eight weeks. So that should cover that period. Um, and we're gonna be using those two weeks to really analyze um, who we've reached. Um, so kind of going back to how can we measure success? How we reached um, the communities that we've said we're gonna reach? Um, and how can we change our approach during the second phase in January to make sure that we are um, doing that, not just through digital, but through other in-person events. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks. No, yeah. uh, we've got um, Councillor Jassel, a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know how to reach areas is one thing, but um, how will you deal with the language barriers with so many different communities? Because not everyone speaks or understands English. And then how will you gather the statistics for the consultation uh, with these communities? Um, because some can't, they can't do it online because they're not computer literate. So how will you sort of like overcome these barriers? Thank you, Councillor um, Sarinda. So um, we will be um, using the same tools we we use for shaping Ealing, I believe we translated that survey um, in nine languages. So we will be doing the same thing for the local plan um, for the shorter survey. We will also be producing um, a summary of the local plan that will complement that survey. Um, and we're hoping to get that translated as well into those languages. Um, so we're not expecting people who don't um, sp speak English um, to kind of read this 400 page document. Um, in the packages that we're producing for communities, we're also hoping to, to put those translations in there so they're able to go out there um, and engage engage with, com with, with the communities that they um, engage with um, in those different languages. Um, in, in terms of collation, obviously Built ID have, have their own kind of um, system for how they do that. Um, the other way, so collating, that feedback from um, other communities and other groups. That's something uh, we're figuring out at the moment. Thanks. Is that um, answered your question? Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is from Councillor Andrew Steed, um, and then we've got a final question from Ray Wall. Councillor Steed, you're on mute. You're, uh, Councillor Steed, you're still on mute. We can't hear you. Uh, Councillor Steed, sorry, we still can't hear you. Um, so if you put yourself on mute for a minute, um, we'll come back to you. Uh, 
uh, my suggestion um, about engaging with those on the so on the housing register uh because they're hard to you know group to engage with and we do probably have their details so it would be it'd be pertinent because they're, they're the ones that are, uh, you know receiving end of whatever we do with this plan Okay, thank you for that suggestion. Okay, Councillor Steed, I'm just wondering if your volume is now working. Councillor Steed, um, because of the technical issues, if you can put your question in the chat um, and then we'll try and answer it now. Um, and if not, um, we will um, answer it afterwards. Thank you. I don't think there's any more questions. I think, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it was um, really comprehensive. I think there's um, a few kind of themes that came out around assurances of like a, a multi-layered engagement approach um, and also around the kind of um, measures of success as well. Um, it, you know, and I, I, I kind of, I do agree that whilst, you know, hard numbers aren't necessarily uh, the best way or best approach, I, I think you've mentioned um, around um, the hard to reach communities and you know we probably do have some kind of average of um, level of engagement on previous things so actually you know doubling that or, or whatever it might be just to have a look at because that um, it comes across as one of the most important things that that um, we want to do with this plan sure. so So, um, Councillor Steve, that he um, has basically just said he doesn't think it's acceptable that we don't have any measures of success. So, I think maybe that's something, you know, a theme that's come through that we should just have a look at um, so that we can maybe answer that for the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, the next um, presenter we have is um, Will Temple, um, and he's the senior consultant for PRD. Um, and he will present um, the inclusive growth study that um, was completed on, um, for Ealing Council. So PRD stands for Partnering Regeneration Development for, for those who are asking. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Thank you. Sam, can you move on to the next slide, please? So just to introduce us and Partnering Regeneration and Development Limited, or PRD, as we're sort of commonly known now, uh, for obvious reasons, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we are a place and economy consultancy, so we specialise in socioeconomic data to better understand places and help develop place and economy strategies off the back of that government evidence um, and we have been supporting uh, the London Borough of Ealing on the inclusive economy baseline. So this is quite a comprehensive socioeconomic baseline to understand uh, the performance of the borough over time uh, with a specific focus on industrial land and the role that uh, the industrial economy plays within Ealing, but also how it supports wider resident prosperity. So we're taking quite a broad view of the socio-economic performance of the borough and how uh, industrial areas sort of fit into that. And I'm quite aware that for those in the room, these slides are quite small. So if you're, eight, I think the pack will have been circulated to you, um, but if not, I can share it afterwards because there's some maps in there, which would be good to sort of refer to as we go through. Um, but the purpose of the inclusive economy baseline is to provide an evidence base to underpin the local plan. So it provides national evidence applied to the local level so it's robust uh, statistical data as you can get from the office for national statistics in the main um if you can move on to the next slide please sam so my role here today is to provide a little bit of context for the other speakers that are going to be joining you today uh, and to sort of look at the economic picture in ealing as a whole uh, before sort of drilling down specifically into industrial areas, industrial space, demand for industrial workspace, and how the two sort of fuse together to have a bit of a broader conversation about uh, industrial land policy. So the first thing to sort of state state the obvious uh, in 
in the room is that uh, affordable housing is Ealing's primary economic challenge. I think that's borne out by all of the data. And if you look at deprivation across the borough, it is the single most uh, single biggest defining factor of deprivation across Ealing. Um, if you move on to the next slide, the, the next bit, Sam, thanks very much. And what those very small graphs in this room show you, test of my memory here, is that increasingly uh, this is an economic challenge as well. And the quality of work uh, is a very important consideration when looking at prosperity within Ealing. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is a phenomenal increase in the number of people and the proportion of people that are in work and, e and are economically active. But the quality of that work is often very poor. So the quality of the work that's hosted specifically within the borough, and that's the only data we can get, we can't actually go and look at the sort of jobs that residents are doing, because we know that a lot of the time they don't actually work within Ealing. A lot of the jobs that are hosted within Ealing are, are of poor quality. And of what, what that chart there uh, on the bottom right shows is that 40% of uh, Ealing's jobs are in typically low paying sectors. And those sectors are defined by the low pay commission as being the sort of lowest paying sectors. Uh, and that's significantly higher than the London average. And if you move on to the next slide, please, Sam. This effectively culminates in a bit of a perfect storm when, uh, when this economy and labour market is rocked by crises, as we've seen by the pandemic, and most recently the cost of living crisis. So firstly, we know that Ealing was one of the most severely affected boroughs in London by the pandemic. We know that we had uh, one, I think it was the second or third highest number of residents on furlough of any London borough. Um, and this is sort of undermined by resident earnings. When we first started doing this study, we, we were sort of of the view, perhaps naively, that Ealing was a relatively prosperous borough in terms of average earnings, certainly in the London context. But when you look at both re resident and workplace earnings, it's significantly below the London average. If you move on one, please, Sam. What that effectively shows, and again, this is very small, uh, but when we've run the numbers in terms of cost of living, when essential spend is considered, so this is just a hypothetical example for a hypothetical household within Ealing. So this is two teachers living and working within the borough, taking into account average spend for all the essentials, whether that be rent, whether that be uh, clothing, whether that be gas and electricity, even professional couples. In this case, a couple earning over £70,000, which to anyone is a good amount of household income, could potentially be in the red at the end of the month with rising costs. So we've developed this cost of living calculator, which I'll be more than happy to share with this committee afterwards. It allows you to effectively model the cost of living in on certain households within Ealing and across London. So that's a bit of a call to action. If you move on to the next uh, slide, Sam, again, what is quite a small diagram, but effectively shows that we know the administration's priority is to create a more inclusive economy, to create more high quality jobs and to have a better and fairer local economy. And one of the key tools you have to pull in relation to this is planning policy. Um, and that's ultimately where industrious Ealing focuses. It focuses on providing better spaces and higher quality spaces. It focuses on what are the partnerships that Ealing needs to develop in order to deliver the change it wants to see, be it with landholders or the private sector more generally, um, and how it sort of embeds this through the local plan underpinned by a robust evidence base. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Sam. When sort of contextualizing all of this big picture stuff which perhaps isn't it's really interesting very important will have massive implications for your communities but actually distilling it down what it means for industrial areas which is i promise you is what the point of uh, why i'm here today um effectively what the evidence shows and that top graph shows that ealing's economy has stagnated relatively so over the last five years job creation has been non-existent there's been no employment growth in ealing according to the government data sets overall over the last five years and that's lower than the england and london average but if you flip on one please sam uh, again, maps that you probably can't see, but what the evidence shows when we look at it on a neighbourhood by neighbourhood basis is effectively that where employment growth has happened, this has been mainly concentrated within industrial areas. So there's been specifically a big amount of employment growth along the A40 corridor, ranging from North Hull all the way through to North Acton. Uh, but there's also been significant growth within locally significant industrial sites uh, around uh, or along the southern edge of the borough, specifically in and around Southall. And if you move on a slide, please, Sam. What is also clear as we sort of 
looked at the numbers and looked at the quality of the employment within these industrial areas is that typically, certainly in places like Greenfield and Perivale, this is typically high value, high quality employment in quite often quite traditional uh, industrial type sectors. So we've done a bit of bit of analysis on high tech manufacturing and what we what we can see there is that parts of Greenford and Perivale are significantly specialized in, in this activity relative not just to the London average but the England average as well and that's not just uh, businesses such as Brompton of what what we know really well but there's also other businesses such as Press the Light which are um, making alternators and things like that so there's lots of really exciting activity going on within the borough which we know about we need to celebrate but what is also worth saying here is often these are typically pretty high paying sectors and something that we definitely want to encourage locally so if you move on to the next slide please Sam the other thing and again this won't be a surprise to anyone in this room is that when looking at the wider industrial land market it is as overheated as any land market is in London at the moment and demand for industrial property is going through the roof and it's probably the epicentre is probably Ealing at the moment just due to the sort of the extent of industrial land supply that you have at the borough which is a competitive advantage but it also means that a lot of the challenges that we're seeing in Ealing are sort of playing out most visibly uh, here as opposed to anywhere else in London so this is manifesting itself in like massively uh, higher higher rents than what we were seeing 10 years 10 years ago and sort of falling industrial vacancy so industrial vacancy is very low across Ealing which is well below the sort of healthy churn rate that you'd like to see to have a healthy sort of rotation of businesses coming and going from the borough and that's pushing up prices and potentially pushing out sort of key industrial occupiers that we'd want to see and retain to grow in Ealing so if you move on to the next slide please Sam the final point that I'd like to make on this evidence and this, the inclusive growth baseline goes into this stuff in a lot of detail, um, is that the key risk for the borough uh, is that whilst um, whilst it's encouraging and it's definitely a good thing for Ealing that demand in industrial property is high because there is job creation potential there, what we are seeing is that a lot of that demand is being driven by low employment density sectors, such as logistics. So these are sectors that they're, they're very well paying in a lot of senses, but in terms of the floor space per job, it's that it takes a lot of floor space for each job filled. So you could result in a scenario where all of your industrial land is sort of absorbed by um, low density type employment which actually reduces the overall job numbers within the borough. So that's the big risk for Ealing. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Sam, just to sort of sum up, because I've probably already spoken for way too long, is that our advice from the Industrious Ealing Commission is that intensification should be on industrial land should be Ealing's priority. And again, that doesn't sound like a particularly controversial thing to say, because it's already within the London plan that advises planning authorities what they should be doing. However, as sort of revealed from the employment land review that's already been conducted to underpin the local plan, plus this piece of work, which we've undertaken, there are very sort of clear and obvious market failures, which could mean that whilst uses which are policy compliant, such as logistics, um, exist within the borough, it could potentially result in a net loss of jobs for Ealing, and that's the risk. And um, so I think what we're effectively advising is that whilst planning policy has to be very clear in terms of the priorities for industrial intensification, it's not the only tool that the council has in order to sort of drive the change that it wants to see. Obviously, you've got lots of existing strategies that will help to sort of achieve a good growth. So you've got your, your plan for good jobs. Um, but there's also other sort of wider uh, levers that the council has to pull to address some of these market failures that we're seeing. One is its own asset ownership. So you are an industrial landholder across the borough. You do have sites in, in, in and around South Acton. If you're being very bold and ambitious, there's potential for active investment within in the industrial land market to drive the sorts of uses that the, the planning policy team and the wider council wants to see. But also, and perhaps a quicker win, is through sort of partnerships and collaboration with existing actors within the borough. 
So we know that Seagrow is a major landholder uh, across Ealing, and this is a, another potential competitive advantage that the borough has, because whilst uh, planning policy on strategic industrial land means that you're sort of limited with what you can do in terms of planning policy, actually having consolidated land ownership in the way that sort of Seagrow occupy in Ealing means that you can sort of have a bit of a single point of focus to to articulate your priorities as a council and work on some shared objectives but i'll leave it there thank you very much thank you um i just want to um, open it up for um any questions uh first up councillor gareth shaw online um and then secondly um councillor jessel just before you ask a question do you want to just take one question at a time or do you want to take a couple yeah, all right, we'll do two questions and then we'll um, open it up again. Thanks. Yeah, thanks again, Chair. Um, just thanks for that. Very interesting presentation and just looking at the industrial um, scope of the land. What was sort of striking, particularly in the, the table, is is the sort of the high tech, if you like, industry growth and just how dominant Ealing itself is you know, com compared to the rest of the borough. You, you mentioned the levers that are available for us. Um, you know, obviously, I think what's what's probably needed in terms of strategy is looking for a, a more borough-wide um, key to bring those high-tech jobs to the, all the different parts of the borough. It is one of the most geographically large boroughs um, in Ealing. Uh, so I was just wondering what, what your thoughts are on that and, and what any of the, the officers I, I see, uh, Mr Barton's here, what, what he might like to say to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm ju I'd just like to backtrack on the risk thing. <laughs> um, I understand, you know, the low the low density sectors, which can limit growth. I just want to um, just ask you, how will you measure this risk? And will this risk assessment be ongoing throughout the project? Thank you for both those questions. Um, so I'll probably defer to the officers for their opinions on on one uh, potentially, and maybe maybe two as well. Um, welcome to jump in. I think I think it's a fair fair question uh, on one. I think the thing to note about the A40 corridor where those businesses are currently clustered is the strategic location of those sites and the availability of premises, which makes them attractive to those industrial occupiers and that's the feedback that we've sort of had from Seagrow throughout but I think Steve can probably or or Sam could probably give a better answer on in terms of the council's sort of strategies for spreading that across the bar. In terms of two, uh, question two and around the sort of risk of low density is I think it's more when I'm talking about risk it's more a case of how it how the wider macroeconomic factors in the borough affects uh, your strategic job creation target. So the risk for Ealing is that it has all of this demand for space, but it doesn't manifest itself in increased jobs, which then undermines your political ambitions to create 10,000 new jobs in the borough. So how we'd sort of measure that on an ongoing basis would effectively be to look at the overall job numbers within the borough. If I could uh, pick up on that as well, Chair, um, it may make most sense to take these sorts of questions at the end in a, in a panel session, simply because um, the, the next speaker, for example, will talk to the uh, to the point of uh, what types of approach we might take uh, to logistics, which would give give different outcomes. I think, um, if I'm correct, Will, your point was essentially that's the classic pattern uh, of um, of development. That's the currently observable pattern in the borough. And effectively, we'll have to look at uh, an alternative strategy if we're to deliver uh, both the, the local plan objectives and, of course, the council's corporate objectives. But perhaps if we um, uh, if we if we could keep um, this set of questions to clarifications and then pick everything up in a panel at the end, it might kind of uh, expand on the on the the, the narrative um, uh, more fully. 
Okay, um, thank you. Um, Councillor Wall, is yours a... It was going to be that, but I've just been stopped asking that question. So uh, firstly, thank you very much for the presentation. There's a lot to take in in that presentation, and you did say you'd share that with us. But yeah, uh, there's a lot. Uh, key thing is obviously intensification of industrial land, um, and we're, we're, I think we're moving on to that. But I just want to ask a small question. You, you said you're based on the Office of National Statistics. I just want to know when, when the dates, is that a continual rolling or is that set in stone? Is that a, cons a census uh, time of doing it? What? When was the dates of these? A very good question, um, because these things are very rapidly out of date. Um, so for every single measure that we've used, we've used the latest available statistics on the ONS. And typically, these haven't gone la any later than 2020. I know the world's changed quite a lot <laughs> in the last two years. Um, that said, the caveat with all of this data is anything that's done in between census years, uh, of which we're getting a new one suit, so, well, we're getting a new one, you all filled it out about a year ago, uh, is that some of it does rely on the ONS to do estimates based on previous census years and extrapolate upwards. So I think there's always some caveats with national data, but we can only do what we can do with the best available evidence to us. But wherever we can, we've used as, as up-to-date statistics as we can. Thank you for that. Um, if there's no other kind of points of clarification, any kind of more in-depth questions if we wait till um, after um, the next presentation. Thank you very much, thanks. Okay, so um, next speaker we have is um, Simon Perks, Director of Capital Deployment and Leasing. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, you just let me know if it, my presentation comes up on the screen. Yes, it's up. Brilliant, okay. Okay, so yeah, so thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, just to say that I am a development director at uh, Prologis. Um, I've been working with the business for about a year now. Um, you know, as a business, we're passionate about ensuring that London remains a truly global city. We've got land ownerships spread around London and the wider UK, especially the Midlands. Um, we don't actually own anything or are not working on anything in the evening at the moment, but we're very keen to, to try and work with you in the future. So just for those of you who might not be aware of who Prologis are, um, potentially one of the largest companies that people haven't heard of, that we own and manage over a billion square feet of logistics space spanning major markets around the world including london new york san francisco and tokyo and just to put that in a slightly wider context approximately two and a half percent of the world's annual gdp flows through our global estate uh, and on a uk basis roughly the same again through our uk buildings and on a daily basis we're leasing approximately half a million square feet of space, which I still find quite staggering to believe. Um, so just in terms of the agenda, I just thought I'd just rattle through some of the issues that we're facing in London, some of the common perceptions around industrial warehousing, and then just finishing on some of the initiatives that we're undertaking in ways that we might be able to work together in the future. And I'm not sure how long, we, how long I've got, but uh, possibly, if I'm going to cut out a section, I'd probably say the common perceptions might be the least relevant. But I'll I'll rattle through if you if I'm if I'm going too slowly, then then let me know. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple of videos in here as well, so I'm not sure whether I've turned my turn the volume on for the videos or not. Um, can you let me know if you can't hear, and I'll just exit and go back yeah, in again. Yeah, that's fine. Great, thank you. So just following on from the previous presentation, it's almost like we prepared them together, um, just to show really just looking at, you know, how warehousing has really intensified over the last couple of years. If we look at internet sales, the proportion of retail sales since the early 2000s, they've effectively been growing on a one percentage basis on an annual basis over the last 15 years. But since the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen that massively spike. So from March 2020 
through to February 2021, we saw that increase from 18% to 36%. This has now dropped back to approximately 25%, uh, but some commentators are expecting this to increase further through e-commerce penetration up to you know around 60%, which I find hard to believe, but clearly there's a lot of pressure there. Um, we've, more, you know, we've all got more time at home, we're all ordering more things online. So then the next slide is just showing the loss of industrial land across London over the last 20 years. And effectively, we've lost the equivalent of two park royals in that time. 1,300 hect hect hectares of industrial land, which has been lost to infrastructure projects such as Crossrail, the London Olympics, but primarily to residential development. And it's fifty percent site density, which is which is low, which is beyond you know below what the um, the mayor's London plan is trying to achieve. That's equivalent to seventy million square foot of warehouse space. So you can understand why there is such pressure on on the warehouse sector. And that really flows through to show that availability across London is currently running at sub four percent, which is an all time low. They generally say that for there to be a um, effectively an equilibrium in the market it needs to be the availability needs to be around eight percent or higher so we're you know we're well below that and that's led to a huge pressure on rents and we've seen them rising over the last three to four years at you know unheard of levels really that have been growing at um north of 15 15 percent for the last couple of years and they're now starting in certain areas of london starting to outstrip office rents and residential values, which is which is incredible, really. So then just moving on to the next session, it's um, we've been doing some research over the last few years and just thought we'd just share some of the, the common perceptions or in some cases misconceptions um, that, that people have raised through our opinion polls. And I think probably the first one to mention is you know, what's it going to offer? How's it going to add any value to us? And I think these really go to the point that our sector is not immediately visible to the general public. I think people understand what manufacturing and retail is, but not necessarily the supply chains associated with making things and the flow of goods to their point of sale. Other comments, including there aren't going to be many good jobs and um, how many will there be? Visual appearance, warehouses are ugly places. Now, for me, that's not necessarily the buildings themselves but the environment that they stand within and i think one of the challenges that we face in london especially is fragmented ownerships and being able to control the surrounding environs other comments they will create loads of traffic how can they be sustainable and we you know, we do believe we do we do think it's not wrong that, that you know that there, are, there are impacts of course there are but we believe that these can be mitigated in in the right way The rise of sustainability coupled with air pollution is extremely important and we're keen to work with our stakeholders through London from customers to local authorities, politicians and communities to deliver a much better solution for London. And we see last mile logistics and online retail as an important component in the aspiration of London to reduce pollution overall. I've heard logistics recently referred to as the fifth utility or the fourth emergency service especially in London, where you've got new developments that are increasingly being obligated to be car free. Logistics providers must surely be seen as essential for home delivery services. So there's just a little video that I wanted to show you. We were doing some work um, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT to undertake some research for us to establish some of the facts. And this short video hopefully helps to show how our industry works, but more importantly, how it can benefit society. So let me know if this, if you can hear the volume or not. If I can't, if you can't, then I'll stop. No, there's no, no volume. No. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave this one. I'll, I'll leave this no, video. No, it's working one. now. Is it? It's working. Yeah, now it's working. Okay.
sorry, the volume's gone again. Okay. I'll just let it run through. So. Sorry about that. But I think you know, the crux of the message there is that the, the closer that we can locate these facilities to the, the, you know, the, the biggest number of households using electric vehicles and dropping the maximum number of parcels in, in one go is, is surely better than everybody ordering their parcels and going to pick them up by themselves in, the, in their cars and therefore hopefully reducing significantly reducing you know, congestion and transport on our road networks. So a further question that we asked for an opinion on as a, after the pandemic um, was around um, effectively their views of warehousing. And we asked the question, since the pandemic has hit, it is important for local councils to plan for and allocate areas for high-tech warehousing to help the online deliveries of goods to your home. And the results of that poll show that 55% of people agreed, but maybe more startling, only 8% disagreed. So the, rea the reality of running out of toilet roll has obviously left its mark during the pandemic. So then that just takes me on to the final section um, in terms of the, the, the initiatives that we're working on and probably what's most relevant for this evening is in terms of intensification of land use and ultimately repurposing. Again, I've got a, a video here that probably I'll I'll just skip through um, if the volume's not working. Um, but what I wanted to highlight through this was that you know providing training and skills to members of the local communities is a really key initiative for us. And at the hub in in Durft, which is up in Daventry in the West Midlands, we're working with a a range of people from ex offenders, people who've been taken off the, the county lines, Afghan refugees. And those looking to ultimately switch sectors um, in order to provide them with the skills necessary to start a successful career in logistics. And this has been a, a really, really you know, successful initiative for us and something that we're really keen to bring to London. So rather than taking the people to the trainer, we want to be able to provide these facilities in all of our developments moving forward so that members of the local community are able to access them readily. So I'll skip that. So then the next bit I wanted to mention was around our park life and park life initiative, which is really all about providing amenities for our customers on the parks, but also for members of the local community. And we think this is really important in terms of enhancing well-being, but also attracting and retaining the best talent. So a number of our parks include facilities such as cycleways walking routes, canteens, gym facilities, showers and cycling parking, which again, we want to include, you know, as far as we can, subject to land, land availability and space, we want to bring to our schemes in, in London as well. And we think there are great opportunities to provide a sense of place, public realm, greening, really open up these facilities to members of the lo you know, local community. So we're not saying that they're going to be walking through the middle of the industrial parks, but if we can, make our buildings open and outward facing so we can provide active frontages and provide entrances off main routes so that members of the local community residents local businesses are able to come in and use those facilities themselves either for for meetings board meetings to go to the gym to to you know, carry out a function or whatever it might be we really want to make sure that they they're opened up for the for the greater good sustainability is massive for us and we've been market leaders in this sector for the last 15 years or so and our buildings have consistently gone beyond the minimum requirements we've delivered our first carbon net positive building in the west midlands in recent years generating more energy than it uses and this is something that we're now in the process of bringing to london we've also been awarded the terracotta seal by prince charles under his former title uh, but 
being the first property developer to be awarded the seal for our ongoing commitment to sustainability. So as I covered earlier on in the presentation, demand for land is in premium, is at a premium, and it doesn't look like changing. So we see intensification of land use in line with the London plan as being absolutely critical. So every building we've built in Japan for the last 20 years is, is multi-level. They're going up to six, seven storeys. And in some cases, they're covering over you know, 2 million square feet of, of employment space. So going up for them is not at all uncommon. And we've been working with colleagues around the world in America, Europe and, and Asia for the last four years to develop our model for, for both multi-level and, and high density warehousing. And we see that as a, as a great opportunity to really increase the number of jobs that we're able to create in a local area, but, but also to be able to um, you know, put industrial land, industrial uses on the right you know, on the right land so it frees up other areas within the local area, the, the local borough to be able to provide residential or um, commercial offices or whatever other uses are, are, you know, are really important to you. It's just a couple of photos of schemes in Japan. And this is a, this is a building that I'm actually working on at the moment in, in West London, in the Park Royal area, where we're working through a scheme currently to go multi-level, looking to go ground plus five storeys. Um, and we'd be yeah, looking to put a planning application in, in early in the new year. So this is you know, very much something that's at the forefront of our minds at the moment. And then just turning to repurposing of alternative uses. So we have in the recent past acquired a couple of um, retail warehousing sites in, in London, up and around the North Circular. So one in Enfield and one in Waltham Forest. And this is a an overview of a scheme that we own in in Enfield, so it borders the Meridian Water Master Plan. And what we're looking to do here is run the income for the next six years, work up a planning application, and submit to Enfield um, with the prospect of being able to build out a multi-level warehousing scheme come the end of you know, the twenties into early early thirties, um, and. Again, there's just a, a short video just to show you how that uh, multi-level building might work um, in the surrounding area. And again, there's no volume, but it's just useful to run it just to, to show you quickly. So that, that's that's really it for me, just to, just to summarise the points that I've covered. So we just looked at some of the issues facing London, some of the common perceptions, and then a number of the initiatives that we're currently undertaking and ways that we might be able to look to work together in the future. And I you know, fully appreciate that that video that you've just seen is not right for every location, it's not right for every site, but if you can find the right you know, site with the right dynamics and the right characteristics, and we think that it can make a massive difference to the future of London, both in the way that warehousing is used, but also how we can intensify land to free up land for, for other uses that are also critical. Um, thank you for that, Simon. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions, but um, just keep in mind um, what Sam said, which is, you know, questions that um, Simon can answer um, and any ones that are specific for officers, then save those to the end. So if, um, please let me know if you've got any hands up. Um, Councillor Raywall. Um, thank you for that, Simon. Um, 
just just one question because we we've, we've obviously got this um intensification and, and logistics dilemma i think going on at the moment just wondered um what sort of level of jobs per square foot in, in sort of this sector is is common i think that's yeah that's a it's a it's a good question it's something that we're working on with our multi-level product at the moment so i think we are we are working um the building that i mentioned in in park royal um we have got roughly 350,000 square feet um and we believe we're going to generate approximately 600 jobs in that building so that that is working currently to a yeah a, a ratio of one one to five just over one to five hundred um square feet and i appreciate that that is yeah that's a it's a probably a <laughs> it's a it's a low we're well, sorry it's a high it's a high figure um but the fact that we're able to go we're up, we're able to go up we're able to you know generate you know significant amount more floor space on that site than is currently there we're going effectively going fivefold in terms of what's existing on 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 the footprint at the moment we're able to justify and generate those those additional jobs on the site thank you um councillor jessel thank you chair <clears throat> um, my question is um I was just wondering if you can just elaborate on um, some of the common perceptions around industrial warehousing. And my other question is, um, basically you mentioned uh, pressure, pressure on office rents. So are you planning then to make them affordable rents? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Sure, both very, very good questions, I think. So that yeah, the, in terms of the common perceptions, I, I tried to cover the, probably the, the the main ones that we had back as part of our polling. But I think the key ones are around increased traffic, um, congestion, pollution, air quality, noise, um, you know, jobs in terms of jobs created, quality of jobs created, um, and yeah, ultimately affordability and what, what you know what types of jobs are you going to be creating are probably the the key ones that we've had back. In terms of affordability, um, it's something that we are looking to do with a number of the boroughs that we're working with is uh, um, around an affordable workspace provision. So as part of the scheme that we bring forwards will be a number of smaller flexible working spaces for SMEs or local businesses um, and various boroughs have different policies regarding level or you know how they would quantify affordability um, but it, you know, for example we're working with the APDC at the moment and they are looking at a, a policy where effectively the affordability is set at 80 percent of of market rent so whatever your your rent might be for uh but you know, based on an open market letting they then take that and draw the line and say right so if, if you're a small business or if you are if you, you know, if you if you tick the criteria then you'll you'll pay 80 percent of that that level of rent might be worth my expanding on that a little bit as well simon sure um, so uh, it was a joint study uh between uh, ealing and uh, opdc and in fact um we effectively will have uh, the same policy which i think will have a lot of value um, uh, for uh, firms seeking to engage with um, the industrial state, which is really shared um, across uh, across borough boundaries, um, and quite happy to expand on that uh, at the end. And of course, um, uh, I'll mention it, so I'll bring it up again in uh, my presentation in a moment. Thank you, Sam. Um, if there's no more uh, questions. Um, we'll move on to um, Sam's presentation. Okay, Sam, um, please go ahead. So Sam Cuthbert, Principal um, Strategic Planner for London Borough of Ealing, um, and you can kind of crack on with your um, presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, Simon, you will need to unshare before I'm able to share. Am I still going, am I? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, 
I'm used to Teams. I'm not really used to Zoom. Sorry about this, everyone. Um, so, I've, I've minimized my um i think you need to actually stop sharing yeah i'm just struggling to find where the um the toggle is to, to do that I might just leave and come I, I might just leave and then come back in again right that should, yeah yeah i'll do that it's Okay, I think that frees you. Is that done? Sorry, I just managed to work it out. <laughs> yep, that seems to have done it. Yeah. Sorry. No problem, right. Uh, that should be uh, my screen successfully shared, is that correct? Yeah. Great. Uh, everyone would be pleased to know I'll be extremely brief. Um, and then we can open up to uh, a general uh, discussion of everything that we've heard. So effectively what you've heard uh, up to now is if you like the industrial half of the uh, economy evidence and uh, policies that will inform the local plan. I'm gonna talk very briefly uh, on the town centre's half. Uh, so effectively um, the, the town centre's uh, policy and evidence in a local plan it would normally have uh, two or three parts. Uh, the first of which would be town centre health checks, uh, which was circulated as part of the document pack. Uh, that's effectively the baseline where we currently are, what our town centres look like, and some very short term um, trends. In this case, uh, very notably the short term trends that have been observable uh, in that data uh, over and as a result of uh, COVID. The second part of that evidence would normally be various forms of need assessments, primarily a retail need assessment uh, and an office need assessment. And we do have those uh, in the evidence base. Uh, in Ealing's case, we commissioned uh, retail need assessments in uh, 2017, 2018. Um, and we have uh, office need assessments in the form of London Office Policy Review. Uh, typically, we would update those fairly frequently. We would update them for the new local plan. Uh, as it happens, and for reasons that I'll expand on in a moment, we've chosen not to. Uh, this time around, largely because uh, effectively we are seeing uh, changes as a result of COVID, which go beyond normal economic cycles, which actually sort of stray into uh, the whole nature of how those markets work and uh, how we provide uh, office and retail. For that reason, um, we are uh, looking at a more exploratory piece of work, uh, which effectively will seek to address the, the policy dilemma. Uh, that's been raised by the government's creation of the E-Class. Um, the planner's joke, and like most planner's jokes, it's not particularly funny, is that the E and E-Class stands for everything. Uh, for those who don't know, it is uh, effectively a, um, an amalgamation of what used to be the separate uh, retail classes, uh, professional service, uh, most forms of um, food provision and sale, and, but not hot food takeaways and not pubs. And most bizarrely and, and relevantly, uh, to this evening's discussion, also light industrial. So effectively, all of those have been amalgamated into a single use class, and therefore our ability to control those through any form of planning process, be it uh, strategic planning, plan making, or development management, is now significantly limited compared to what it was. Uh, to compound that, there are also linked permitted development rights, uh, particularly for office and retail to residential. Those do have limits. There are largely uh, limits of floor area. There are certain limits about uh, when uh, those office and retail premises uh, became, uh, came into those uses. So we're not necessarily talking about uh, cascading changes of use, but uh, effectively all of that together constitutes a fundamental dilemma and problem for the management of town centres. As a result, uh, this is a, it's a, a joint study of almost all the West London boroughs. I think uh, Brent is not a partner. Um, but uh, all the others are. It's um, a considerable uh, concern and quite a difficult um, issue to grapple with. But one of the advantages we do have, uh, which underpins this, underpins also a lot of the town centre health checks at work, uh, is a much improved set of data tools, which have come along, I think, almost coincidentally uh, at the same time as the uh, pandemic. 
uh, and let us measure uh, a lot of the, the, the changes that we've seen on that. And the, uh, the no doubt very small diagram on the right hand side of the screen is just an indicative dashboard of some of those measures uh, for uh, Ealing Town Centre. What will the study then do? Effectively, uh, the proposal that we uh, accepted is uh, to say, first of all, what is the quantitative definition of a successful town centre? So leave aside the uh, important but subjective factors and actually how can we describe in terms of uh, the content and function of a town centre uh, what constitutes uh, success and then uh, what policy recommendations uh, can achieve this. And it specifically therefore seeks to uh, look beyond um, existing uh, policy boundaries and understand in particular new catchments and hubs, how people actually access and use uh, different uses within town centres, uh, going far beyond um, retail and office and actually looking as in the town centre health checks at all the, the range of uh, public services, uh, civic functions, uh, and everything else. Um, the diagram that you can see again, probably very small, the map that you can see on the uh, screen there uh, is an initial output uh, of the work, uh, which most of you probably recognize as uh, Southall Town Centre um, and uh, Hanwell Town Centre. And effectively, that is a, is a visual representation of um, the kind of uses we can put this data to, of actually looking uh, where are different uses uh, located and ultimately who uses them and how and in what combination. So effectively, the, uh, the whole objective is to understand the town centres as integrated and mixed concentrations of different uses, not just in the, uh, the former uh, slightly stayed way as uh, primarily agglomerations of uh, office space or uh, retail space. Uh, it will also, uh, so also in addition to the state analysis, uh, make uh, recommendations within the, the legal constraints of the new E-class and other various uh, aspects of government policy. Uh, it, it's effectively, as I said before, an attempt to uh, address what we could really characterize as exaggerated uncertainties in office and retail demand, by which I really mean uh, these go beyond normal business cycles, ups and downs that we're all familiar with. They actually constitute fundamental changes in, uh, in how these uses um, are, are used and, and the business model for providing them. So very briefly then to try and draw uh, all of the uh, uh, discussion together, all the presentations together and, and hopefully uh, open up uh, to uh, quite a free flowing question session. What does local plan policy, what do these two halves, the industrial half and the town centers half uh, look like uh, in terms of emerging recommendations for the local plan? So, uh, in summary, uh, the first um, feature is that we will be looking uh, to protect industrial land. We have quite a finite uh, quantity of it. We have exceptional demand for it, demand which will uh, require uh, intensification. And I think one of the things we've tried to bring out this evening is the intensification uh, has perhaps in the past in London been uh, depicted as being easier than it really is. There isn't probably a good practice example in London, in the UK at the moment, which does what we will ultimately do too. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, to see Prologis uh, bringing uh, their experience, especially from Japan. It's probably a realistic uh, understanding, particularly of logistics space, that actually we need to be looking to emulate uh, best international uh, good practice in order to achieve the sort of objectives that we're setting ourselves. Similarly, the intention uh, is to grow the size and range of employment offer for all the reasons that uh, will set out effectively that um, that uh, wage shortfalls and quality of employment are two of the biggest challenges we face uh, as a borough but then also to uh, address a, a range of other supporting factors uh, such as supporting culture and creative industries and um, to drive uh, policy will uh, indicate that we'll drive industrial intensification uh, across all of our designated sites. There is the possibility, I think, um, on a case-by-case -case basis to examine mixed intensification, at least on uh, LSIS sites, and that would uh, be subject to master planning. To pick up the point that was raised before, we will be delivering um, more and in, in fact delivering uh, some for the first time actually defined affordable uh, workspace. You will have seen in the document pack uh, the 
really rather uh, long and complex uh, affordable workspace study. Uh, the benefit of having done that work is that the, uh, the policy output, which as I mentioned, we will share with OPDC, is actually a, a nice, uh, tight, clean, simple policy. But behind that sits effectively a very large and complex description of both what affordable constitutes in uh, particular contexts and for particular industries and what workspace constitutes uh, for those industries uh, as well. So quite happy to expand that uh, in the questions if that's of interest. Uh, we'll also uh, be looking to maintain and enhance the unique role of the Metropolitan Town Centre uh, within the borough. It has quite a distinct um, commercial employment uh, offer, uh, particularly as no doubt Will can speak to in relation to um, value added uh, or uh, knowledge intensive uh, sectors. Uh, more broadly, uh, the work that we've, all the work that we've done, be it town centre work or be it uh, industrial work, has highlighted the uh, distinctive economic rule that different town centres offer. There are different strengths in different parts of the borough. Uh, and again, we'll look to bring that out uh, very strongly in policy in relation to uh, town plans for each of the seven uh, de defined towns in the borough. Uh, and finally, a strong and diverse uh, nighttime economy. That's a task that's been set for us by the London plan. It's perhaps something we have grappled with uh, less effectively in the past, but is very much of a piece uh, with the other uh, needs that we've identified. And I think you can expect to see quite a lot on that. So at this point, I will stop sharing. And very happy to take uh, any questions, either uh, probably first in, in terms of clarification and then I think the objective will be to revisit some of the, uh, Chair, with, with your uh, agreement, some of the uh, questions that were raised before and, and perhaps uh, have a more free-flowing free discussion on that with the other speakers. Thank you, Sam. Um, have, I, have we got any questions? Yeah, so, because oh, I started with you last time. So yes. um, I'll start with uh, Councillor Jessel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have three questions, and um, my first one is, um, could you please elaborate on the fundamental problems for planning management of town centres? And the second one is, um, also, if you can just elaborate on that for me, um, when you say uh, specifically seeks to analyse beyond policy boundaries, and the third one is um, when it states, we'll make recommendations to address class E. So what recommendations will you make on class E? So those are my three questions, thank you. I will try that. Uh, the, the way these things usually work, I'll probably uh, answer the first and the second, uh, sorry, the first and the last and forget the second. So please do remind me. Um, the fundamental problems I referred to, they're basically arising from the, uh, the class E use. So effectively, um, uh, our ability to uh, control development, what development is defined as, is uh, either uh, building works in on or under land, or it's changed between particular uh, use classes. So formerly, uh, town centres were managed uh, according to a, a whole series of different use classes and sub-use classes. So, uh, the A, A classes, which were predominantly retail, uh, the B classes or a B2, which was professional services, for example, so uh, banks uh, or solicitors offices would traditionally fall into that. Um, uh, restaurants being a, a, a different use class as well. And uh, of course, uh, light industrial being uh, not a town centre use. So what the, um, what the creation by government of the class E uh, has done is to say these are all the same uses and uh, subject to uh, physical changes to buildings, which would still be uh, governed by the planning process, would still require planning applications. Uh, these uses can change between each other quite freely. So uh, the, I think the, the single major challenge I would draw out from that is the traditional problem with um, uh, town centre retail and out of town retail. Um, if the effect of the amalgamation of all these uses into the uh, one, one use class, class E, is we cannot, for example, control um, the spread of retail uses into industrial sites, uh, as, as we have, have sought to do in the past. So uh, in, in relation to the two areas that we've spoken about this evening, 
uh, our ability um, both to protect the retail off offers of town centres and also to protect our supply of industrial land uh, is quite directly uh, compromised by Class E. And then there's uh, a whole series of issues um, which you can probably begin to imagine around the kind of fine grain of managing um, uses within town centres. So where formerly we might, for instance, seek to consolidate retail frontages and to have uh, primarily uh, conventional retail uh, in those, uh, we now do not have necessarily uh, control over the uses within those uh, those frontages. Um, and forgive me, I have forgotten the second question that you asked me. You could remind me of that. And the second question was um, when it stated Pacific East seeks to analyze beyond policy boundaries. I thought yes, you could just right. explain a little bit. Thank you. Absolutely, very happy to. Um, so that basically relates to, again, a traditional feature of management of town centres, which is basically to define uh, primary and secondary frontages, uh, which would have, as I said, those different characters of retail. Primary might traditionally be reserved for A1, which is conventional retail, secondary frontages might allow at higher uh, proportions of non-retail uses, so for example, uh, food uses. Uh, now, the, the creation uh, of the E-class is predicated on the fact that that level of, um, of management and planning uh, is no longer desirable. But in addition to that, our sort of evidence in the past, our policy approach in the past, has probably been too rigidly contained by those boundaries, uh, both of uh, particular designated frontages, but also town centres overall. So the objective of the study is to look at all of those uses wherever they exist in the borough, uh, including a, a, a significant number which will be outside of designated centres, outside of um, primary and secondary frontages, uh, and examine how people access those, uh, how they use them. So it will basically be unconstrained by our current uh, policy designations that will be seeking to establish, if you like, a comprehensive evidence base of all the town centre type uses in the borough, uh, and understand how people uh, how people use and access those. Thank you, um, Councillor Wall. Uh, yes, mine is not mine. Aren't there's, there's, there's comprehensive to that? Um, Sean, it would it be helpful to leave your last slide up, so we've got something to um, ask. You know, to a framework maybe to look at. Uh, very happy to do that. Just be aware I won't be able to see raised hands or anything like that once I've done it. I'll share my screen again. Okay, thank you. And the second one is, um, I can't. I think I know the answer, but nighttime economy. Uh, what what is it meant by nighttime economy? I know what I think it's meant by nighttime economy, but I'm just thinking how how easily that can be um, widened in terms of you know night working i think of it as pubs and clubs and restaurants and things like that but i i think it's wider than that and just wondered if that's how it is um in terms of i mean logistics centers i presume work 24 7 uh etc so i just want i just want to know if you could tell me that what what you think the definition of nighttime economy and how we'd actually make it stronger and more diverse um, I think you're quite right. That's basically the central question. Um, so traditionally, it would have been pubs and clubs. It might have extended um, uh, as far as cultural institutions and or cinemas. Uh, but a lot more of it is to do, uh, which, again, is why it's related to uh, broader issues of the economy, related to uh, quality of employment. And if you think in relation to the industrial state, uh, people who are shift workers and or um, uh, have um, unsociable hour commutes, uh, it really is about understanding what town centre uh, functions people want to access at what times. Um, and I think the, the flip side of that also, as colleagues in regulatory services would certainly be saying if they were here, uh, is uh, it shouldn't just mean um, uses which may be antisocial, which, uh, you know, which may uh, in the past have uh, produced antisocial behaviour and made town centres less attractive. I think the, the need for it much like the, the broader analysis that we're talking about doing in the, the Class E study, uh, is to understand how all those uses interact with each other. Um, so that, that, as you say, that really is the central question, is how can nighttime economy be broader than uh, pubs, clubs, and, and maybe at, um, at you know, a, a wild and charitable extension as far as perhaps cultural institutions? 
Does that answer your question? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I'm just, just looking at the list now. I might have another question. Here. Um, I've got a question. Um, so um, just um, in regards to affordable um, workspace, um, and I was kind of reading um, in in the pack around, you know, if a developer um, doesn't think it's viable, then they're, they're not going to produce it. I, I suppose um, I was just trying to kind of understand what is the def definition of a, like a affordable workspace um, in in those terms? And also, uh, are we wholly reliant on developers um, to produce that type of work um, space? Um, I mean, to take the last part first, um, uh, we're by no means reliant on developers. And, and thankfully, now that we have this piece of work, we have the um, evidence to understand both what's affordable and what's workspace. Um, you know, the council can seek, can allocate or can seek uh, to access uh, external funding to provide uh, that workspace uh, at any time uh, that we choose. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's, a, it's a fantastically complex uh, study and I don't, um, I don't seek to hide that. Um, however, the, one of the uh, implications of the study is that it is likely based on a sort of viability assessment, based on uh, industrial and uh, office pipelines, that we will wind up with a situation in which the majority of the uh, contributions are off-site contributions, they're financial contributions. And that's largely because of viability on individual schemes. Effectively, you require quite a large scheme uh, in order to um, viably provide uh, enough space that that can then be uh, operated in a way uh, which makes it both an efficient use uh, of the funding, uh, but also suitable for the different types of uses. So I'll, I'll give an example of that. Um, if you're talking about uh, affordable industrial space, for example, uh, that is likely to have a focus on small scale on startup uh, businesses. It's not uh, useful to those, it's not an efficient um, uh, use of funding to just take kind of penny packets of space on every scheme all across the borough. In fact, um, what experience has shown, what that research showed is they benefit more from working in, in hubs, from working in clusters, from having shared facilities, uh, which both expand uh, what, uh, what facilities they can access, uh, but also um, there is a, there's a, there's a benefit and a, to agglomeration, to dealing with other, interacting with other uh, enterprises and companies. So effectively, the implication of that work is uh, it will support a local plan policy, much like that, that OPDC uh, is, um, is, is trailing in its, I think, now published supplementary planning guidance, which, as I say, derives from the same uh, evidence, uh, in which we're, we're able to secure contributions toward that. Uh, effectively, the next part of the work um, to be done is for those majority of schemes in which the provision would be would be offsite, would be financial, uh, is the council needs a business plan for uh, the provision of that space for how to spend it most efficiently. And again, one of the reasons the report is, is quite so long and intricate is that it sets out uh, what the requirements of each of the different sectors are and which we might uh, choose to prefer, particularly in the early stages while funding is just starting to come in. Uh, and all of that really should start linking to uh, the emerging economic strategy for the, the, the borough um, of, the, uh, of the, the, the type that Will spoke to earlier about uh, the particular employment needs that are identified, the particular uh, strengths um, and uh, within given industrial uh, sectors or uh, research and development sectors, uh, all of that needs to be a part of the, uh, part of the strategy for the provision uh, of that space. So effectively, um, the, the evidence will allow us to secure that policy. It will enable us to start bringing those contributions and uh, it's, it's incumbent on the council uh, as this process develops to determine the best ways of spending that. There will also be, it's important to note, and I think that's why we're very keen to have uh, a logistics speaker uh, this evening to, to, to talk about larger industrial spaces. There will be some occasions in which um, that provision is on site. Uh, which will be not a large number of occasions, but if you like, a very significant quantity of space when it comes forward. Uh, and in those cases, the, the applicant effectively will be expected to do the same thing in miniature. So they really need to produce a business plan for the affordable uh, proportion 
uh, of the space. Um, so a, a very, very broad topic. Hopefully that answered your question. I mean, quite happy to go into, uh, into more detail on, on any aspect of that, if that's helpful. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see anybody else's hands up. Um, anybody online that has got questions? Sorry, because because the presentation's up, I can't see any hands. Yes, Actually, yes, I do, Chair. Okay, yep, um, Councillor Shaw. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to really put it into sort of plain English, um, if you like, Sam, that what, what you're suggesting is that the uh, type E category, if you like, um, allows flexibility for developers, but also removes the control of the local authority in real planning terms and, you know, how, how it could be applied. I mean, that, that is absolutely the common sense summary. Um, effectively, um, it's, it, it's even more, than, uh, more fundamental than, if you like, removing planning controls. It's actually... Uh, it's tinkering with the legal definitions of what different uses are. So it, the, the effect really is to kind of um, degrade the resolution, if you like, of the entire planning system. We can't uh, see different uses as distinct from each other necessarily uh, within the E-class. Uh, we can't control those uses uh, as we used to. Uh, and so I think a lot of this um, uh, of necessity and one of the reasons we're looking at a... Um, at a broader, more holistic approach wherever we possibly can, is there will probably have to be more attempts to encourage um, particular types of development activity uh, and less ability to control it than perhaps we had in the past. Yeah, thank, thanks. I, I thought it was just important to get that sort of answer, if you like, on, on record so that it, it's recorded publicly as well. Um, and also to go back and quite rightly earlier on in the meeting, you you did say, can can you wait and, and let's get through the rest of the presentations, if you like. Um, so again, you know, what what would your advice be um to us as as members, if you like, on on the control that we have and the levers? Because you know, basically you're saying a lot of these levers are being removed or have been removed from us. Yeah. Now, so, you know, in terms of industrial planning and where my earlier question was to do with sort of high tech jobs and higher paying jobs and the, the dominance of Ealing itself and how we reach around the borough um, to, to different areas to bring those jobs in, then, you know, what, what would you like to sort of advise us, if you like, about that? Um, I think. That's, that's a good and very broad question. I'd encourage um, uh, Will and Simon to, to, to jump in uh, after this. I think the, the main thing from a planning perspective, um, I think that there are extra, there are be, uh, tools beyond planning, um, which will need to be uh, sort of coordinated this with that. The main thing within planning is probably understanding uh, what, the, what the development pressures are, what effectively, uh, what the market uh, is seeking and demanding and setting out uh, for that a more comprehensive vision of uh, how we think uh, it should be realised in the borough. So both uh, where we should have particular uses, but also the quality of those uses, uh, if you see what I mean. And uh, a large part of this, um, sort of the, the, the component of the discussion, which, which sits in the employment land view, which is effectively the, the, the demand component of the work that we've done, um, is really about understanding how much, uh, how difficult it is going to be to create the economic incentive for reuse of our existing uh, industrial land. Uh, so we're in a situation where we have a, a, an absolutely scarce resource of industrial land as distinct from say housing. Uh, we can expect uh, the proportion of uh, the borough in housing use and the floor space of housing uh, to expand um, over the planned period. Uh, we can't necessarily uh, expect that on industrial sites and so uh, it will be it will be very much about setting out some proactive strategy, including, um, uh, for example, the possibility of um, mixed use but industrially led space on some industrial sites, particularly where they're uh, highly accessible, adjacent to town centres, for instance. But it is it's it's the interesting and in some ways unfortunate uh, situation in which we may have to encourage more 
and be able to control less um, than we than we uh, did in the past. Um, I will stop uh, sharing the screen just so that uh, people can see other speakers. I don't know, uh, Simon and uh, Will, if you wanted to chip in on any of that. I'm taking that radio silence as a no. <laughs> I, 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 sorry, I, I would just make the point that um, I, know I understand that you're working on a number of local local neighbourhoods. So I think it's, believe it's is it seven local neighbourhoods. So it's rather than just focusing industrial land on your strategic industrial area, it's looking at potential ways of um, encouraging investment for, for industry you know in, in other areas of the borough which might be which might be appropriate to do so um now whether that is part of a a mixed use scheme whether it is traditional b2b8 distribution storage industrial or whether it's more of a you know a lighter flexible um you know kind of enterprise use as opposed to you know kind of a traditional industrial use it's yeah. It's really looking at what what types of uses can work together outside of the traditional industrial heartland, and how they impact on on the surrounding neighbourhoods. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Will wants to jump in as well. Thanks very much, Chair. Just to add add to that, really, and what the inclusive economy baseline does also do, if you get a chance to go through it, and it's something I didn't get a chance to present today was that whilst we presented the sort of borough-wide picture today, it does go into specific recommendations for individual towns and actually categ categorise the role that industrial land plays within different parts of the borough and the different policy levers that might be available in those different parts of the borough based on the evidence. So, for example, looking at the evidence, uh, the report recommends that places like Southall and Northall actually have a stronger case for direct public sector intervention, where the market is less developed compared to somewhere like Greenford or Perivale. Um, so there is that sort of geographical specificity, which is in the report as well. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or are there any um, other um, contributions from Sam or oh, Councillor Wall? The, um, I mean, since obviously everyone knows this, but uh, since COVID, it, everything's kind of changed a little bit because the industrial base could be your home at the moment. And, and for a lot of people, it is for certain parts of the week, if not all the week. So I just, you know, I, I just wonder where the economy is going in terms of office space and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, should this be part of our debate uh, going forward? Um, you know, even people like industrial in their own backyards and what have you, their own garages in some cases. So um, I, I don't know where that comes in uh, and if that's a reality or if that's a, you know, a slight myth since COVID and people are starting to return to work now. I, I don't really know where the trend is going, but I think we should sort of factor in those sort of things when we're looking forward. Uh, certainly for the next five, ten years with this local plan, where it's going to go. So I just wanted to put that in. It's not really a question. It's just something that we should start thinking about, really. Yeah, and um, kind of j just to go um, back on um, the, the stuff you mentioned, um, Sam, around um, the changes to regulation of E-Class, um, you know, whilst we're going out... Um, you know, and surveying our communities and asking for their input on uh, the local development plan. Obviously, those things, those issues are going to have an impact on on ideas and um, how we can take those forward as well. I can attempt to grapple with that if that uh, is, is uh, of interest. Yeah, it was more of a, a rambling, but yeah, please do. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, I think I think both both uh, sets of points are extremely valid. Um, as I said during the presentation, I think it's it's fundamental to the work that we're doing at the moment um, that co conventional approaches would work, and that we're dealing with forms of heightened uncertainty. Uh, conventionally, in planning, what that requires is, if you like, a less tight control of things and a, and a, a more flexible strategy, a strategy which is. Um, 
uh, designed to cope with unexpected events. Uh, there are interesting things to pick up Councillor Wall's point around um, uh, office provision. And uh, for example, uh, there's, the, there's the, the likelihood, the possibility of uh, Ely Town Centre in particular being picked up as uh, one of the successful um, office centres, one of the centres in which, uh, uh, which can secure investment, you know, effectively at the expense of other centres in London, which is probably uh, members are aware of the uh, Broadway Connection. Uh, proposals, which is a very large uh, new office centre uh, in the borough. Uh, there are uh, a number of other factors around that, for example, um, uh, new energy uh, efficiency standards, which are going to make a lot of uh, both the borough and the town centre's uh, office space uh, unviable, unsuitable for occupation in the future, and uh, also around London, effectively, the, the focus would be uh, on the occup uh, occupation of grade A space uh, in future. So in that respect, uh, like uh, with the knowledge intensive industries that will identify, we may be, we may be fortunate uh, moving forward. Um, but uh, one of the aspects of that, which is sort of the reason for the, how we designed the programme for tonight's meeting is there's probably gonna be a much bigger blurring, uh, not just of these different uses uh, with residential, but between these different uses. So effectively, um, it is likely there'll be a bigger crossover between the types of economic uses on towns, in town centres and on industrial sites, and not just because we, we effectively lose control of those through the E class. Uh, and one of the things, again, the uh, industrial ceiling uh, baseline identified is we're quite fortunate in having uh, a lot of um, town centres that have some association with uh, industrial space. Uh, so, for example, um, Acton Town Centre is close to both South Acton Industrial Estate and the Vale. Um, uh, Southall Town Centre uh, runs to a whole series of different in, uh, industrial areas, including the Great Western Industrial Estate, for those who know it. Um, and uh, in fact, a small industrial estate at, at Bridge Road, uh, which is almost within the town centre, and then uh, in, industrial space uh, south of the canal uh, as well. So the, effectively, um, the intention behind all of this work is to sort of throw up the broader patterns um, of how these different economic uses interact. And uh, while, our, um, while our ability to control a lot of these uses, fighting as we used to, uh, is also being removed, is quite possible. Um, we would be looking at kind of curves on the effectiveness of those measures as well. Uh, so again, uh, the, the importance of setting out sort of what we want to achieve, uh, communicating what we want to achieve and looking at that in detail in each application is probably, is probably as close as we will get to, an, to a strategy uh, during this kind of period of, of exaggerated uncertainty. So hopefully that wasn't too rambling, but did reflect on the, on the two points that were raised. Um, thank you, Sam. If nobody's got any um, further questions, I'll start um, drawing the meeting to a close. Um, but just to um, summarise um, from the beginning, um, just around um, the, the feedback um, and taking that um, on board. Um, so, yeah, um, which, which would be great, um, just to, especially around the kind of multi-level of um, engagement, um, etc. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think you mentioned that... Um, I think it was Will that you were going to share um, the calculator for the cost of living. That would be great as well. Um, and I think everybody should have had all the packs. So, but if there's any information missing, um, please shout and we can um, circulate that as well. Um, so the next, um, the date for the next meeting will be held on the 22nd of November. So thank you everybody for all your contributions. Really informative. Thanks. Thanks.